Welcome to the next lecture in the series on condensed matter theory. In this video, I want to talk about response theory, whereby response theory is an integral part of what we do in um, condensed matter theory. Uh, because whenever you make a measurement, you make a perturbation to your system, and you want to see how the system responds. Um, you're never able to observe the system in its ground state, because in order to observe something, you have to well, interact with that system, and with that you make a small perturbation. For example, if you want to measure the conductivity of your system, you apply an external electrical field, and you look how the induced current is flowing, so how big the induced current is. If you want to measure the um, magnetization of a sample, you apply a magnetic field and you look at the induced magnetization. Um, if you want to know the acoustical properties of a room, you make some sound and you see how the sound waves are reflected and come back to you. So, if you think about the response of a system, Then we can have a look at some observable, for example, the position of a particle. But this can equally well be the dipole moment or any other observable and an external action. This can, for example, be the force on a particle such that you see how the position changes as a function of the applied force. But this could also be an electrical field, and then you look at an induced dipole moment or any other external action that one can apply. Now, if we want to understand how the system responds by this external action, we can first of all realize that the response at time t, you can easily think of the position of a particle at time t, can only be influenced by the forces at earlier times. So your particle is not going to respond before you put some action on your system. In order to express x of t in terms of f of t, we can use a Volterra series. Where we express the position of our particle in terms of a zeroth order response, the position at t minus infinite, plus and then we have an integral from minus infinite to t, where we look at the force that we applied. And then of course we have a response function that tells you how the particle at time t is influenced by the forces at times t1. Now you not necessarily have to stop at just linear interactions, you might have particles that also have quadratic responses. For example, if you think of a particle on a surface with some resistance, then when you apply a small force, nothing might happen. But when the force is big enough, it well, might start to flow. You have some stickiness that you have to apply a minimal force to get some reaction. So we can have also a quadratic response that tells you how the particle at time t is influenced by the forces at t1 and t2. Etc. Now our response functions or susceptibilities, um, the zeroth order, first order, second order, up to the nth order, depend on 
the time that we measure, and then the times that we applied the forces. For a system that is invariant under time translation, which most of our systems are, it doesn't matter if you do an experiment today or tomorrow, you're only allowed to be sensitive to the time difference between the time that you measure and the time that you applied the force. So here we have t minus t1, t minus t2, up to t minus tn for an nth order response function. If we now define tau n as t minus tn, where well, tn has to be smaller than t, such that tau n is positive, then the position at time t, sorry for having x's and chi's in there, is equal to chi zero plus, and now we sum n is one to infinite for the first up to infinite order response, an integral from zero to infinite, because we look at times tau before our measurement, where we have n of such integrals, and then chi, the response function of nth order, which depends on when we applied the forces, and then times a product of the forces we have at the time t minus tau, and then we have to integrate over all times at which we applied the force, or at which we look in our response function when we apply the force. Now, for a system that is invariant under translation in time, we know by the Noether theorem that the energy or by the noted theorem, we know that there must be some conserved quantity. And from earlier lectures, we know that this conserved quantity for translation invariance in the time domain is the energy. So we have a system where the energy is conserved. Well, and the energy in a force field, in a photon field, is given by the frequency, so it makes a lot of sense to make a Fourier transform. And see what happens in the frequency domain. Well, even if you would not have known that we live in a world where the energy is conserved whenever you have time translation invariance, you see that the position here is given by a convolution of the susceptibility with the applied force. And whenever you have a convolution, then you can make a Fourier transform and then the integral over the two at different times becomes a product of the two. So whenever we have a convolution, we know that when we make a Fourier transform, this will become a product. So there are two very good reasons why we want to have a look at the frequency domain instead of the time domain for our response functions. So let's define the position as a function of frequency, which is basically the amplitude of that Fourier component in your position dependent, um, in your time dependent position. And this is just the Fourier transform of x of t, e to the minus i omega t dt. And the same we do for the force. This is the Fourier transform of the time-dependent force that we apply. So with these two definitions of the position in frequency space and the applied force of the frequency as a function of the frequency, we can now make a Fourier transform of our position as a function of time expressed with the use of response functions. The Fourier transform of x of t is x of omega. 
and that is equal to and now we have first the Fourier transform of chi zero minus infinite to infinite chi zero e to the minus i omega t dt and then we have a Fourier transform of the rest plus integral minus infinite to infinite which is the Fourier transform e to the minus i omega t dt and then in between we have the response functions for first to infinite order where we have one to infinite integrals for the nth order response function tau 1 up to tau n and then the product j is 1 to n f the force of time t minus tau j times the infinitesimal delta tj. Now we can evaluate these integrals and we'll do this term by term instead of having all terms at once. So for the zeroth order term this is the Fourier transform of a constant and the Fourier transform of a constant gives you a delta function so that is 2 pi chi zero delta of omega. Then if we focus on the second order or the first order term, we have the integral minus infinite to infinite of e to the i omega t. Then we have n is 1. So that's an integral and we're going to change our boundaries now from minus infinite to infinite and we are integrating d tau 1 and we can of course do this if we add and have a side theta function such that our function is zero for tau one negative. That's, that allows us to extend the integration boundary such that we can make a Fourier transform. Then we have chi one at time tau one. We have our force at time t minus tau one. Then we have e to the i omega t and now I'm gonna write this as e to the i omega t minus tau 1 and of course then I have to apply another e to the minus i omega tau 1 such that in the end I only have a t left then we have d t minus tau 1 d tau 1 where well, here I changed my integration boundaries, which go from minus infinite to plus infinite, so it doesn't matter if I shift them a little bit, because that domain is infinite anyhow. And then, of course, I have also a third order response, etc. Now, let's define the Fourier transform of our response function, the susceptibility, the first order susceptibility or the linear susceptibility as the integral of minus infinite to infinite theta tau 1 then the susceptibility in the time domain e to the minus i omega tau 1 d tau 1 and then what you see, what you have here in the linear response is a Fourier transform of the susceptibility and a Fourier transform of the force such that your total position in the frequency domain is your zeroth order term 2 pi chi zero delta of omega plus the linear response chi one of omega f of omega plus of course, the higher order response functions. So what we have are two functions, either in the frequency domain or in the time domain, that tell you how your system reacts as a function of an applied force. And instead of position and force, we can think of uh, induced polarization and electrical fields, induced magnetization and magnetic fields, 
or any other action as a function of, or any other reaction as a function of some action that we apply to our system. What I will do in the next videos is have a look on how we can calculate these response functions, either in the frequency or in the time domain, for different materials and different models that we have. I will first do this for two very specific models. I will have a look at a classical harmonic oscillator and at a quantum uh, system where I will take a hydrogen atom where the electron is in the 1s orbital and we put on an oscillating electromagnetical field, so light, and see how the system reacts. And we'll derive the um, response functions for that, the linear susceptibility, and we'll show that um, they are very similar, or basically equivalent in the form um, if you either look at a classical system or at a quantum system. And we will then generalize this to see the expectation value of some operator as a function of an action given by some other operator and see how we can calculate in general the response functions of our systems. For now, thank you very much. We'll see each other later. Stay healthy.